You know, uh, speaking of the snow and ice, I remember several years ago, well, maybe more than several, one of the ski trips I was on with our youth group. And it's always amazing if you've ever been snow skiing, one of the most difficult parts of skiing is not just simply learning how to ski, but how to get on and off of the ski lift. It can actually, <laughs> yeah, me and John has a good story about that one. But it can actually be a dangerous thing. Matter of fact, they'll always instruct you if you don't know how to do it. And I watched a woman one year, and she was just terrified. She was dying to go up the mountain, but she was terrified to get on that lift. And they kept telling her, ma'am, listen, here's the most important thing. As soon as you feel the seat hit the back of your legs, you sit and lift your feet. Well, everything went well. Here come the chair. It hit the back of her leg. She sat. The only problem is she wouldn't lift her feet up. And so it drug her about five yards forward with the front of her skis just plowing into the snow until finally, poof, it just plopped her right on her face. Indecision can actually be a dangerous thing. And especially when you're trying to keep one foot on one realm and put one in another. That's kind of what we're going to be looking at this morning where a man of fire, God's fireman, if you will, the man Elijah, when he called down fire from heaven, but he actually asked God's people, choose a side. Which side are you going to stand on? You can't keep a foot in both worlds. And so I want to talk to you and to talk to especially our men this morning about being willing to stand alone. And there are two examples we're going to focus on this morning. One is Elijah and the other is Jesus, who was the toughest man who ever walked the face of the earth no one who was more willing to stand alone than he. But at first, I want to summarize the phenomenal story of Elijah. Elijah, if you don't know the story in chapter 18, he basically was told by God to go and tell King Ahab that there was not going to be rain on the land until he said so. And so uh, Elijah abides, and he went and he told the king, there's not, going to be land, um, there's not going to be rain in the land until I call for it. See, what happened was going on at the time is the number one god of the land was the god known as Baal, B-A-L, B-A-A-L. Baal is the, rain, the god of rain. And so therefore, since God said, well, y'all think he's the god of rain, I'm going to show you who the god of rain is and the god of everything else. And the Bible says that for three and a half years, not one drop fell. Now, most of us can't even imagine if you've ever lived even here in the south where we've gone through one of those spells, maybe a couple of months or two to three months where there's been no rain, everything starts dying. Everything. The grass, the trees. Can you imagine being in a land that's already partially barren and de uh, surrounded by deserts and now going three and a half years without a drop of rain? How dry, how desolate everything must have been how desperate everybody must have been but then the time comes when God tells Elijah now go see the king and tell him the rain's coming and it's going to come at your command and so Elijah goes and keep in mind Ahab has been looking for Elijah this whole time he's looking for him to kill him because he knows he's the one responsible for the drought and so his thought process is if I can just kill him and take him out we'll solve the problem and so as Elijah is going to meet King Ahab, he runs into another prophet who was actually a good prophet of the Lord that Ahab had sent in one direction as he went in the other. And Elijah runs into him and he says, you go tell the king that I'll meet him at Mount Carmel. And Obadiah, the other prophet, is scared to death because he says, listen, man, as soon as I go tell King Ahab, you'll meet him there. You ain't going to be there because God's going to pick you up, move you somewhere else, and then he's going to end up killing me. He said, no, you go tell him, and I'll be there. And so Obadiah does just that. And that's where we're going to come in today at this showdown, if you will, between the one true God and the God of Baal and the man who stood in the gap. Elijah was looking for somebody who was man enough to stand up with him. We're going to see in this story that not one soul could be found. Not one man, not one woman, not one anyone. And so 
we don't have time to really uh, focus on a lot of the verses in here this morning. We're all going to read through them in just a moment. But I encourage you, if you're not familiar with this story, to spend some time studying it. To ask that question, what made this man man enough to do it? You see, personal dangers didn't seem to matter to Elijah, not at least at this time. The mob may have already been rendered to lynch him when he came, but he didn't care. He was God's man in God's place at God's time. I wonder how many of our men in here today have that same attitude, that you want to be God's man in God's place at God's time. This is that time, men. This is that time. If ever there was that time, this is it. But we live in a society today that wants to neuter manhood. People want you to believe that there is really no difference between a man and a woman. It's all learned. And because of that, we're raising a generation of men who don't know what it means to be a real man. But I'm going to tell you what I believe to be the traits of manhood in the life of Elijah and especially in the life of Jesus. And so for all you men and young men in here this morning, I want you to know if you want to be a real man, God's man, these three traits you must possess. Take your Bibles and stand with me this morning. This is my Bible, the light into my path. I believe it is the indestructible, inexhaustible, infallible Word of God. I am who it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. My mind is alert. My ears are open. My heart is receptive to receive God's Word. Today I will be forever changed. I will never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. These three traits actually come from a book written by a man by the name of Robert Lewis, and it's called Raising a Modern Day Knight. But I want us to look real quick. Notice real, let's start in verse 17, but I want us to focus on 20 through 40. In verse 17, it says, When Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is this you, you troubler of Israel? Do you know when you stand for God, man, I'm going to go ahead and tell you right off the bat, you're going to be accused of being a troublemaker. If you stand on the principles of God, especially in this world and in our society today, you are going to be accused of a troublemaker. It's inevitable. It cannot be avoided. You're going to be accused of of being a troublemaker. And the amazing thing here is Ahab really believed that. He believed it, it was Elijah that was the problem, not him, not his false worship and all his false prophets and leading a whole nation into that. But jumping up to verse 20, so Ahab sent a message among the sons of Israel and he brought the prophets together at Mount Carmel. Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people did not answer him a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left with the prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Now let them give us two oxen, and let them choose one ox for themselves and cut it up and place it on the wood, but put no fire under it. And I will prepare the other ox and lay it on the wood, and I will not put fire under it. Then you call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. And all the people said, that is a good idea. So Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one ox for yourself and prepare it first, for you are many. And call on the name of your God, but put no fire under it. Then they took the ox which was given them, and they prepared it and called on the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, O oh, Baal, answer us. But there was no voice, and no one answered. And they leaped about the altar which they had made. It came about at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Call out with a loud voice, for he is a god. Either he is occupied or gone aside or on a journey, or perhaps he is asleep and needs to be awakened. So they cried out with a loud voice and cut themselves according to their customs, with swords and lances, until blood gushed out of them. When midday was passed, they raved until the time of the offering and the evening sacrifice, but there was no voice, no one answered, and no one paid attention. Notice what's happening here. 
I'm just going to pause here for just a second to make a brief point. Not only is there no answer and no voice because there is no other God to answer, by now it says, and no one's even paying attention. These guys are ranting and raving, and I'm sure it was actually comical, entertaining when the day first starts. Or maybe they were actually hoping something was going to happen. But first it goes from morning till noon, nothing. Then they get to lunchtime and they take it to a whole other level with Elijah actually sitting there mocking them. They begin to cut themselves, crying, dancing. And the Bible says, there was no voice, no one answered, and by now, no one's even paying attention to them anymore. Verse 30, then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. So all the people came near to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. So with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench around the altar large enough to hold two measures of seed. Then he arranged the wood and cut the ox in pieces and laid it on the wood. And he said, fill four pitchers with water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. And he said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And he said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. The water flowed around the altar and he also filled the trench with water. At the time of the offering, offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, Today let it be known that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Then Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized them and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there. Father, as we look into this passage today and at this account that took place in the life of this man, this man who was actually able to call down fire from heaven, this man, Lord, who was able to call down fire from heaven because I believe he had a fire burning in his heart. And so, Lord, we just pray today, especially for your men who are gathered here, to whom you have directed this message, praying that their hearts would be open and receptive to hear your words today, not mine. And that, Father, we may truly be and strive toward being the man of God that you have created us all to be. We ask you these in all things. In Christ's name, amen. The first trait I want you to see this morning is this. A real man rejects passivity. To be passive. A real man rejects passivity. Elijah was told to go and present himself to Ahab. He knew it wasn't a safe thing to do. He knew Ahab could have killed him on the spot. But he does this, and he not only goes before the king that could have cost him his life, he goes before the king and challenges the king and all his prophets. This particular passage we just read tells us about the 450 prophets of Baal. There were 400 more prophets of Asherah. So actually, he was up against 850 men, and he stood alone. He stood alone because Elijah refused to be passive. Ahab sent word through all of Israel. He brings a whole nation together. He tells them there's going to be a showdown. But did you hear the passivity when we read through the verses? Look at verse 21 again. Elijah came near to the people and said to them, How long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people did not answer him a word. That's passivity. That's passivity. Don't know, don't care. The people said nothing. Elijah was man enough to stand alone, but passivity kept the others from joining. Listen, anyone who's been around boys any amount of time know that they have a natural aggression to explore. They're naturally more aggressive than girls. Um, there's just something 
inside of a, a boy. Take a, a little brother. You know what most older brothers do when their little brother comes running by? Trip them. And they say, why did you do I don't know. What do they do to their sisters? They usually beat up on them or they'll tackle them. They think they're their tackling dummies. Or they punch each other in the arm. Why do little boys do all this stuff? It's an inbred aggressiveness. It's physical and psychological. It's not a learned behavior. It is innate. It is part of being a man. In order for the Carolina Panthers to win the Super Bowl tonight, they're going to have to be aggressive. You know why they're going to have to be aggressive? Because every inch they want to move that football forward on the field, there is going to be what has been titled the best defense in the NFL that is opposing them, that's trying to stop them, that don't want them to move forward one inch. So in order for them to be successful tonight, they're going to have to be aggressive. They're going to have to be aggressive. But for some reason, men of every age seem to become passive when it comes to initiating their action, this action in their homes and in their families and in their communities. Why does that happen? Why? Why when we as men will sit there and cheer tonight? We want to see the Panthers. We don't want to just see them win. We want to see them pound them, pound them, kill them, tear their heads off. But then oftentimes when it comes to the serious issues of life and God, we're like those men. Well, I, you know, I, I, I'm not going to say anything. I, I don't want to upset somebody or ruffle no feathers. I don't think con Elijah was concerned with feather, feather ruffling. I think that was the last thing on his mind. Why does that happen to men? It all happened in the garden. That's where it all started. When the serpent approached Eve with this tantalizing proposition, he convinces her that that forbidden fruit is actually her path to life. And Satan coaxes Eve. He tells her, listen, if you will just eat it, you're going to be like God. The stage is set for Adam to intervene. After all, Adam has been given the responsibility of the garden. He's the one that's been given the prohibition against eating fruit. It was spoken to him by God. God has given the first man three things, and they still apply to each one of us men today. He has given him a will to obey. Don't eat the fruit. He's given him a work to do. Cultivate the garden. And he's given him a woman to love. That's the three responsibilities of every man. A work to do, a will to obey, and a woman to love. You fully expect Adam, what should he have done? You know what most men do? If a woman sees a snake in the garden, they come running with the hoe or the shovel or whatever they can find. You expect Adam to do the same. But confronted with this social and spiritual responsibility, Adam becomes, of all things, passive. Passive. Have you ever wondered what he was doing all this time that the serpent was talking to his wife? I think most people assume that he was busy or maybe he was out, you know, picking some fruit or tilling some soil or something. Not true. He was right there the whole time. He was watching his wife contemplate moral and spiritual suicide. The text says that she gave some to her husband. The only way that could happen is if he was standing right there with her. As naturally aggressive as Adam was in creation, the moment of authentic manhood arrived when he was called upon to take responsibility, to take charge spiritually, to protect his woman, Adam just stood there. He went flat. He became passive. Men have been imitating Adam's example ever since. You ever wonder why the Bible constantly calls men to love their wives, spiritually discipline their kids, and responsibly lead their homes? The reason is because we have fallen short of it from the garden all the way up till present day. It comes with maleness. It comes from Adam. It actually says that we have a falling nature that is bent now away from God. And I want you to think about that bent aspect for just a moment and what it actually means. 
Because when God created man, he created man to stand upright and strong. The Bible commands us over and over again as men of God to stand. Yes, there's a time to advance, and, but there's a time, and more important than anything, he calls us to stand. When it is time to move forward, think about how you bend when you walk. You bend forward. You lean your head, and you're on a mission wherever you're going. That's what you're supposed to do. Okay? I am, I am the master of cutting through a crowd when it comes to on a mission walking somewhere. If you're ever somewhere with me on a church outing or something and there's a mass of people and we need to get through it, here's what you do. Grab my back belt loop and hold on tight and be ready to walk. And I'll show you how you get through a crowd. Why? Because I've got a point I'm trying to get to, and most of the time when people get in masses, like they're just kind of meandering. I'm going to cut, weave, step, move back, forth, and be through it in a matter of seconds. Well, one thing, I can't stand a crowd, and the second thing is, i got somewhere to go. But listen, when he talks about being bent, what he's saying is, instead of us being upright to begin with, and then bent to move forward like we're supposed to, He's talking about this kind of bent. You're bent backwards. You're bent away from your purpose. You're bent away from being able to move forward. Do you know what a man bent this way can do? Not a whole lot of anything. Because you don't have balance. If you even try to get through a crowd and something bumps you, you're going to spin, you're going to turn. And that's what it says. When we become passive, we're, we're bending backwards. You can't see where you're going. You can't see what's happening around you. And you can't do anything about it if you are aware. Yale sociologist Stephen Clark says flatly, men have a natural tendency to avoid social responsibility. And without a vibrant spiritual solution, this pattern of passivity grows effortlessly. In other words, you ain't got to do nothing. And it don't stay the same. It gets worse. The older you get, the worse it gets. It is now more and more prevalent in American men, and it is breeding death to our culture. Families cry out for men who will do more than tune out when they get home from work. Kids want dads that are involved. Dads who provide more on spiritual directions. Dads who are affirming and life-giving. Women Still want a man who will protect them, not use them. Society needs men who will stand for moral absolutes. But we must stop and ask, where are these men? Where are they today? We've had over 20-some men and two women, and some have dropped out now, that's wanting to be the next leader of this nation. Over 20-some men and two women. And out of those over 20-some men... Do you know how many of them I believe are this man? One. One out of all of them. I'm not going to tell you who he is. Do a little research. Read on them, who they are, where they've come from. You come and tell me who it is. And it's the same in every election. God gives us one choice. One choice is what he gives us. And we can make all the excuses, well, they can't win, and they can't this. and they. He gives us one choice. And if we are following his spirit and seeking, searching truth and somebody who lives that truth, his choice becomes pretty evident and clear. And listen, I know people tell me all the time, for the last several elections, I hadn't voted for either one of the two top choices. I've done a write-in, and people say, well, Pastor, you're just wasting your vote. You're just voting for the winner. Let me tell you something. When I stand before God Almighty, I don't care about the winner or anything else. What I'm going to be answering for is he says, in each election I gave you one choice, Chris. Did you choose my choice? That's what I'm going to be responsible for. And you. Where are those men? Paul's answer is almost too painful to bear. He says in 1 Corinthians 15, 22, for as in Adam... All die. All die. But that's only half of us. There's a second Adam, the Bible says. And his name is Jesus. And that's why he's called the Son of Man. 
And the second half of the verse, just as it says, for as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. Jesus, unlike the first Adam who stood flat-footed in the face of evil, Jesus initiated. He refused to do nothing when sin encroached upon the created order. He was spiritually and socially aggressive. In fact, I would argue with you there was more manhood in the manger than there was in the garden with Adam. There was more manhood in a baby laying in a manger than what Adam showed that day in the garden. Why would you say that, Chris? Because Jesus basically had rejected his divine right as God. He said, I can't stay up here in all this glory and watch what's happening down there to the glory of my creation. I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to become a man. I'm going to change the world. Listen to the action words in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. You got that one up, Joshua? I'm scared I'll be using a different translation if I use mine. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That's manhood. That's manhood. Real manhood begins with the decision to reject the social and spiritual passivity when nothing the nothing is the more comfortable and natural position. In verse 21, Elijah literally says, how long will you hesitate? Some trans translations use the word limp between the two opinions. And what he's saying is, men, passivity makes you lame. It makes you lame. Why should you be more involved? Why should you reject passivity? Studies say that children involved with their fathers are more confident and less anxious when they're in unfamiliar settings. They're better able to deal with the frustrations in life. They're better able to gain a, self, a, a, a sense of independence. They're more likely to become compassionate adults. They're more likely to have a higher self-esteem, more likely to have a higher grade point average, and are more sociable. It's time for God's men to stop being passive and to engage. A real man rejects passivity. A real man accepts responsibility. What did Adam do? He blamed Eve. Lord, actually he blamed God and Eve. Lord, that woman you gave me right there, that's where all the problems come from. He blamed Eve. Don't you just feel sorry for him? It was almost like he didn't even have a choice in the matter. Or at least he wants us to believe that. It's the most common excuse today. It's not my fault. It's my parents' fault. It was my upbringing. I didn't go to the right school when I was a kid. I can't find the right job today. It's all these excuses and everybody's fault and nobody wants to take responsibility for nothing. For nothing. And it is crushing our nation. It's killing us. It's killing us from the inside out. We look at the examples we get from our leaders. In just a few years ago, we had and still have right now war veterans that have gone and laid their life on the line for this nation that are dying because they can't get medical care. We've got documented facts of it. You know how many people in this whole scandal with billions of dollars being spent on it and they still can't get the care they deserve, have earned, and you know how many people have lost their jobs? Three. Three. Then we have an ambassador of our nation killed on foreign soil along with three other Americans to which no help was ever sent. No one. No one. And not only are they not held responsible for their actions, now they get to run for president. Like Adam. Jesus was also given three specific responsibilities from our Father. He was entrusted to obey. He had a work to do, redeem the lost. 
and he had a woman to love, the church. According to Psalm 40, verses 7 and 8, you got that one up? Then I said, Behold, I come in the scroll of the book, it is written of me. I delight to do your will, oh my God, your law is within my heart. A passage that is decidedly messianic. But listen, Jesus accepted his responsibilities with enthusiasm. What a contrast with the first Adam who rejected God's will, said no to God's work, and refused to love God's woman. On all three accounts, Jesus did the exact opposite. He accepted his responsibility, and so should we as men. Men, I accept, uh, challenge you to accept the responsibility of making your marriage the best it can be. Do whatever you got to do. Pray whatever price you got to pay to make your marriage work. And you say, well, Pastor, you, you just don't know my wife. Well, she can't be all bad. She married you. And you say, well, you, 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 you just ain't seen that. She's just unbearable. You see her here when she's at church with her happy face. That may be true. But I do know that you accepted that responsibility when you said for better or for worse, before a preacher, before a congregation, before Almighty God, you said, I am going to stay faithful regardless. Now my question is, are you man enough to do it? Will you accept the responsibility? Also accept the responsibility of your children. Statistics show that children are far less apt to remain faithful to God if their fathers are uninvolved in the things of God. You are setting the pattern for your children to follow, men. It's not your wife's responsibility to raise the kids. It's yours, too. Now, that doesn't mean she don't have a part, but today is the men's turn, so we'll wait for Ladies' Day for me to talk to them about the other side. But I challenge you to accept your responsibility to reject the passivity, to accept the responsibility, and lastly, to lead courageously, to lead. Elijah went before the people and said, how long are you going to waver? Make up your mind. If God is God, then follow him. But the people said nothing. He was leading whether they were following or not. I think part of them probably wanted the, Baal, the, God, the God of Baal to be right because no one come to stand with Elijah. Listen, if fire had a fallen when they had prayed, they'd have killed him on the spot. He would have never even got a chance to build his altar. All those prophets, 850 to 1 is what his odds were. How do you like those odds? Let me tell you something, men. I love those odds. Standing alone, standing alone is one of the most enjoyable things you can ever do in your Christian life if you stand alone with the truth. Now, if you stand alone with a lie or you stand alone with sin, it ain't going to be very much fun. But it's a great feeling to stand alone with the truth. In the last days, and these are those last days, there's going to be a lot of people sporting a brand of Christianity that looks and sounds good but will be powerless. We are living in those last days, and the world has seen enough fakes. They've seen enough weak need, empty-headed, two-faced, finger-pointing, big-talking, no-walking, wimpy-acting, church-playing, godless-living, non-giving, doubting-pouting, gossip-spouting, three strikes and you're out, and I've got problems big as a mountain, cussing on Friday, but Sunday morning shouting, Christians, they've seen enough. Elijah's about to teach us a lesson that we should all know. That kind of Christianity ain't going to cut it. When the chips are down, you've got to have something real or you're going to be exposed as a fraud. And a watered-down gospel is not going to light anybody else's fire for Jesus. And wishy-washy Christians will never have the impact that one single man or woman that's on fire for God can have in a community, in a church, in a family, in any setting you put them in, they're going to make an impact. And if you're here today and you're living that life right now, I can promise you, you're making an impact. You may not be able to see the results right now, but you're making a difference. And if you're not, and if you're faking it, and you look like a good Christian on the outside, but inside you know the power's gone. You know you're not walking with Him. You know you're not talking with Him you're supposed to. He wants to light your fire again today. He wants to light your fire, man. You can't do this by yourself. Authentic men were designed to lead, not follow. 
1 Corinthians 11, 3. Listen to what Paul says. If it is disagreeable in your sight to... Uh, y'all jumped ahead of me, Joshua. Back up one. But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man, and the man is the head of the woman, and God is the head of Christ. Men were created to lead. Adam relinquished his leadership in the garden when he refused to step forward with God's word and lead his wife. And this inaction is precisely what men are doing in our generation. Passively yielding to the feelings and emotions of the moment instead of aggressively leading with God's truth. After Jesus had fasted 40 days, the Bible says that he was taken by Satan and shown all the kingdoms of the world and told, I'll give it all to you. I'll give it all to you if you'll bow down. It compares kind of the same thing he did to Adam and Eve. This will all be yours. You can be just like God. Just eat the fruit. And the contrast couldn't be stronger. Jesus said, actually, away from me. Away from me. For it is written to worship the Lord and serve him only. It is a commanding cry of manly leadership. Away from me. I will hear no more. I will listen to no more. Even Joshua drew a line. He said, if serving God seems undesirable, choose for yourself who you're going to serve. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Men, we need to make that our theme. We need to reject passivity. We need to accept responsibility and lead courageously. That's what God is calling us to do. That's what he created us to do. Elijah could have prayed for rain, but he didn't. You know why he didn't pray for rain? As badly as he knew it was needed, he knew the people needed to understand even more that God was the giver of rain and of all good things. That the reason that their land was so barren and things were so bad was because they had turned their backs on God. That was the heart of Elijah, and it should be ours as well. Manhood is challenging. It can be interpreted as work only, another burden to carry. No joy and no satisfaction. The first Adam actually believed that. And he defected for another glory being offered to him. A second-hand glory. Many modern men are doing the same thing for the same reason. But biblical manhood was never intended to be burdensome. Real manhood was designed by God to be liberating and a means of a great reward. What kept Jesus in the race? What internal motivation carried him to the cross? He said, for the joy that was set before him. A joy. If you think manhood is a call to merely heavy responsibility and dutiful sacrifice, then you have completely missed the example. Real manhood is tough. It demands courage. It requires sacrifice. But men, listen, God is calling us to life, not to burdens. Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Let me put it this way. If the only thing that you are striving for right now is a paycheck on Friday, I feel sorry for you. If you think that's the greatest part of life is how much that check is when you receive your pay, there is so much more to life. And that's why men aren't involved in their homes. It's why so many men don't take responsibility for their marriage. It's why men don't get involved in the church. Because the greatest reward they see each week is on a piece of paper that they take to the bank. But men, listen carefully to this. There are a lot of rewards much more gratifying and satisfying than a paycheck. When you get involved in the things of God, you get to see amazing things happen. Things you know you could never pull off on your own. You get to start to make a difference. And it's not only a difference here on earth, it's a difference for all eternity. Do you know how many living sacrifices were offered in the Old Testament? None. Everything had to be slaughtered first. But Jesus changed all that. And that's why Romans 12, 1 says, Therefore I urge you, brethren, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. Living sacrifices. Dead don't, God don't want dead sacrifices anymore. You know, the last several years, I've really thought and spent time and wondered, what could make a man 
fly an airplane full of people into a building full of people? What can make a man put a bomb on his body and pull up to a checkpoint and detonate it? Are they crazy? Are they brainwashed? But when I think about how we are as men and I think about how it actually fits into who we are, most men would love the challenge of giving themselves to something bigger than themselves. They just haven't found what that is yet. And unfortunately, as misguided as those terrorists are, that's what they're doing. They've given themselves to something bigger than themselves, totally misguided, completely wicked, evil, but yet they're willing to die for it. They're willing to die for it. And that's some negative examples, but there are some positive ones. I know all of you have probably heard the phrase before, remember the Alamo. Remember that story? It illustrates what being a man is all about. 187 men against the Mexican army of somewhere over 3,000 men. These were extraordinary men. Almost every one of them, you can go back and read their history and the things they did, and it was phenomenal. But even they knew they could not win with those odds. They knew it was impossible. They had sent out pleas for help, and they'd gone unanswered. And at some point, Captain William Barrett Travis realized the reinforcements would not arrive in time, and they were going to be defeated. And so in a stirring last speech, he explained to his men the gravity of the situation. He told them they could surrender or fight and face an absolute certain death. He actually drew a line in the dirt and said, As for me, I have decided I will fight until I die. Anyone who wants to join me, step across this line. All but one of those 187 men, all but one of them, one actually fled and ran out the back. Those men included Davy Crockett, even Jim Bowie, the man who had commanded the volunteers. Listen, he was so sick and suffering from pneumonia, he was laying on a cot, and he asked them to pick him up on the cot and carry him across the line in the sand. They knew they couldn't win. They fought anyway. Every single one of them died. But because of that, we're still talking about them today. Thousands of people visit the Alamo every year. Why'd they do it? Why didn't they all like that one slip out the back during the night and get away? I'll tell you why. Because a real man loves a challenge. A man loves to give him something, self some, to something greater than himself if he can just find what it is. Don't you realize that's how this country was founded? When those men signed the Declaration of Independence, they weren't sure they were going to defeat England but they were sure that it was a cause worth dying for. Men, I've got a challenge for you today. I'm not going to draw a line in the sand, but I believe God's doing that, and I'm asking you to be a part of something greater and tougher. Step across, not and just give. Step across to give so that you may live. Rather than die for your wife, why don't you live for her? Rather than die for your children, why don't you live for them? Rather than die for Christ, why don't you live for him? He don't ask for any dead sacrifices anymore. He calls us to be living sacrifices. And hey, who knows? The day may come for one of us men that we have to be willing to die for one of those things or more. We may see persecution right here in this nation in our life. Maybe one of us may have to give our life one day in a, some type of crime situation to save our wife or our children. And if that day does come, I know I'm ready. Are you? Are you ready? Ready to stand alone? Ready to lay it all on the line? Ready to lay your life down, if that's what it should call for. Now, that's not today. Today we're called to step forth and live. So I'm inviting all of you men. Embrace those traits. Reject passivity. Stand and be God's man. Accept responsibility. And then lead courageously. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Father, for the call that you have placed upon our lives as men.
And we realize, Father, that we are losing the battle. That we are in the fourth quarter. That we are down. And the clock is running out. But, oh, Father, if we will simply stand, if we will simply choose to be this type of man who rejects passivity, who realizes, Father, you have sent us here to be engaged in this world, that we would be the man who accepts responsibility, that, yes, we're going to do some things wrong, we may make some mistakes, but when we do, we own those mistakes, and then we learn from it and move forward. And that we would be the type of men that would lead courageously. First and foremost, our families. And then in our, your church, in this community, and in this nation in which we live. Father, we can't do this ourselves. It is only through the power of your spirit that lives and dwells within us. The only part we can do and must do is say yes. Say yes to say yes to your will, say yes to your way, and to accept those three things you have given each one of us as men. A will to obey, a work to do, and a woman to love. We praise you, we thank you, and we ask you these and all things in Christ's name. Would you stand with me?